fighting handling problems, Guncock manages to hold off a last-second charge and wins the closest race in the Indianapolis history. Hello, I'm Paul Case. Gordon Johncock's car number 20 was a familiar sight at Indy in the 70s and early 80s. It was always fast, but if a two-time Indy winner could be called unlucky, Gordy would be the one. In 1973, he won the rain-shortened, disaster-marred race. And shortly after his thrilling 82 win, personal tragedy would cut short the celebration. Through it all, Gordon Johncock remained professional in victory and gracious in defeat. He became a legend at the Indy 500, a race for heroes. On a rainy day in Hastings, Michigan, two-time Indianapolis winner Gordon Johncock goes about his business. Far away from the hectic pace of IndyCar racing, Johncock enjoys working in the quiet seclusion of his 160-acre farm. It's the perfect refuge for a driver who never was comfortable in the limelight. When I got done with racing, I was ready to get on an airplane and come home and, and go about my business, you know. I had other things I was doing, and I really didn't care to travel, you know. I really, I guess I've kind of lived out of a suitcase since I was 18 years old, packing and unpacking and moving uh, from one motel to another. And I got enough of it racing, not being on the circuit of giving talks and and doing all that, I just, it's something I did not enjoy. A Michigan native, John Cox began his career driving modified races throughout the Midwest. Shortly after moving up to sprint cars, John Cox sponsors bought a roadster for him to drive at Indy in 1965. He was 28 years old. With most teams switching to rear-engine cars, John Cox was one of the only six front-engine roadsters in the race. He qualified 14th and finished the race in fifth place, two spots behind the Rookie of the Year, Mario Andretti, and four ahead of fellow rookie Al Unser. Coming back to Indy in 1966, Gordon Johncock had tasted victory at Milwaukee and was ready to make a serious run for the checkered flag. He started from the outside of the second row, but was quickly involved in a massive pileup. Gordon Johncock was driving a rear-engine car that had a two-speed Halibran rear engine. Mario Andretti, I think, was on the pole. And he had it kind of in his mind that he was going to win the battle for the start. And we came around fairly fast, and I had to shift into a higher gear. And uh, so did Gordon Johncock. And he had shifted, of course, with only two-speed uh, rear end or two-speed transmission. He really was kind of in a bind. At the same time, Billy Foster was storming up from the fourth row. He had a five-speed transmission, and he was really working his way up through the pack in a hurry. And he tried to squeeze between me and another car and went over my left front wheel and hit the wall. And then that's when everybody started going every which way. Fortunately, no one was injured in the melee, but 11 cars were eliminated. Five cars, including John Cox, were damaged but able to rejoin the race. At that time, repairs were not allowed during red flag periods. So by the time John Cox was back on the track, he was nearly three minutes behind the leader. When the race was over, Gordy had run the 500 miles faster than the winner, Graham Hill. John Cox finished fourth. Due to the enormous expenses involved, Gordy's sponsors pulled out before the 67 race. But Goodyear came through setting up the John Cock racing team. John Cock then asked Kalamazoo, Michigan businessman Jim Gilmore to help sponsor the team. And I looked at Cordy and I said, by golly, I know your name from, uh, from the dirt car races around here and the other races that he was in throughout Michigan because I'd always follow them in the paper. Cordy and I started talking about it. He said, well, will you drive up to Hastings and see our shop, our garage? So I did so and looked it all over and uh, saw what they were building. And that was the beginning of Gordy's and my relationship. Starting from the outside of the front row, John Cock ran well, but nobody could touch Parnelli Jones and the STP turbine. Gordy was in the top 10 when a punctured tire caused him to crash on his 188th lap. A.J. Foyt went on to win after Parnelli dropped out. The next three years were tough for John Cock Racing. Fifth spot was his best start. 
he did not finish any of those races. John Cock was successful at other tracks, but Indianapolis was another story. At the end of 1970, John Cock Racing dissolved, and Gordy stepped into a one-year-old McLaren for the 71 race. On the 12th lap of the race, he was involved in a nasty accident. Steve Kristoff uh, blew an engine, I believe, going in turn three. Now Kenyon came along and, and spun in the oil. I went over the top of him and ended up sideways in the groove. And Mario Andretti came along and hit me broadside. I can remember I got criticized pretty heavily for uh, getting in this accident after the yellow was on and everything. Uh, for what I did, but uh, the rest of them that came along and spun afterwards too and everything really never got the static that, that I got for some reason. I don't know why. I guess maybe I was easy to pick on or something, <laughs> whatever, but uh, we were all pretty lucky in that accident. As an official member of the McLaren team in 1972, John Cox blew six engines before qualifying on the last day. He started 26. At 110 laps, Gordy had charged up to third place, but retired three laps later. At this point in his career, John Cock looked more like a hard luck loser than a legend. And his shy demeanor didn't set well with the media. If I got upset every time that something bad was printed about me, uh, I'd probably been upset quite a lot. <laughs> but I just kind of went out about my business and probably a lot of the articles I never read. As far as that goes, I had people tell me about it, and other people, I think, really got more upset about it than I did. Gordy never would become a darling of the media, but his racing luck would change. In 1973, Gordon Johncock stepped into Pat Patrick's STP car number 20. It was an association that would last for 11 years. The first was probably the toughest. Rain on race day forced a delayed start. When the green flag came down, Salt Walter tangled with another car, causing a massive 12 car accident. Walter was the only driver injured, suffering severe burns to his hands. And before the track could be cleared, it began to rain again. The race was postponed. Another day was lost because of rain. And when the race finally began on the third day, John Cox was ready. I've often had people ask me, even other sports people, say, how do you get yourself psyched up to run the race? And I said, what do you mean? You know, what do you, what do you mean to get yourself psyched up to run a race? I don't have to get myself psyched up to run a race. Uh, you just go out, you put on your uniform and your helmet, and you go out and you get in a race car, and it's part of your job, you go to work. You know, I don't have to. I don't even know what they're really talking about when they say, how do you get yourself psyched up uh, to get in a race? By the 25th lap, seven cars had dropped out, and John Cock had moved from the fourth row to the front of the pack. On lap 40, Gordy took the lead, but was soon passed by teammate Tweed Savage. Savage held on to first until pitting on lap 54. Five laps later, with his car understeering badly, Savage spun off of turn four, hit the inside wall, and cartwheeled down the main straight as the car disintegrated. Savage died 33 days later. When the race resumed, Al Unser took the lead, but gave it to John Cock on lap 73, shortly before dropping out. Gordy led the rest of the way. On lap 133, the race was stopped again because of rain. Gordon Johncock was declared the winner. I don't think, you know, uh, winning the race in, in, in 73 was really that exciting to me. Uh, for all the things that did happen and, and the delay of the race, as long as it took, most of the people were gone. Uh, we had been through so many days of trying to get the race over with, and I think it was just, like I said earlier, something that everybody wanted to get done with and go home because there'd been so many accidents, there'd been so much rain delay, and everybody was tired. John Cox 
had the dubious distinction of winning in a year that most people would just as soon forget. I could run with anybody on the racetrack that day and had led more laps than anybody else had. And like I say, it just wasn't a situation where we happened to be there in position and, and, and won a race. Uh, we had won races uh, before that. We, we were capable of, of winning races, and uh, it's the way it happened. Gordon Johncock returned with the Patrick Racing Team in 1974 and ran strong. Despite having his car impounded briefly in a dispute over the turbocharger, Johncock qualified for the inside of the second row. Starting the race fourth, Gordy held his position. He finished fourth as Johnny Rutherford came from the 27th spot to capture the checkered flag. In 1975, Gordy was quick again. This time, he started from the middle of the front row between A.J. Foyt and Bobby Unger. Getting the jump on two of Indy's finest drivers, John Cox took the early lead. Posted the fastest time of the day on lap two. Led the first eight laps, but dropped out on lap 11 with a broken gear. Bobby Unzer went on to win the rain-shortened race. Following the disappointment of the year before, John Cott came back in 1976 to sit in the middle of the first row again. This time, between Johnny Rutherford and Tom Sneva. On lap 20, Gordy was in the lead. He hung on for 18 laps. Though he never led again, John Cock remained competitive. Just after the halfway point, the race was stopped because of rain. Rutherford was leading and declared the winner with John Cock third. It was the shortest race in 500 history, and Gordy was still looking to prove he could win going the distance. I never felt that I had to prove anything to anyone that I could go back and uh, and win a full 500 miles because uh, there wasn't too often that we weren't competitive uh, during the race and was not capable uh, of winning the race at any time. 1977 looked like the year that he would go the distance. Starting fifth, John Cock was up to second by the 10 lap mark. Soon he was leading. As the halfway point approached, Gordy was clearly in control. He pulled ahead for what would be 83 straight laps in the lead. With a sizable cushion on A.J. Foyt, John Cox stopped for fuel at 180 laps. As he left the pit, his engine was over-revving severely. Back in the lead on lap 184, John Cox slowed considerably coming out of turn four. He coasted down the main straight and pulled off the track inside turn one. I guess that's probably the one race that I was the most disappointed ever in uh, of falling out because the race most of the day was between Foyt and myself. I think my engine blew with 16 laps to go and I had about a 13 second lead on AJ at that time when my engine blew coming down the front straightaway. And I just pulled off and turned one on the grass, got out of the car and went down and laid in the creek. <laughs> Disappointed again, Gordon Johncock would be back. In 1978, Gordon Johncock was in his sixth year with Patrick Racing. Gordy had a pretty aggressive driving style, and uh, Gordy always believed that it caused him to crash a time or two during the year which we could pretty much count on him to do at least two a year. Uh, but he was always fine, so that didn't bother us too much. But he, he, always, he told me that he believed that when he came up on another car and the driver in that other car ahead of him saw 20 in his mirror, that he wanted that guy to think, here comes that crazy son of so-and-so and, and pull over and get out of his way. And that's, that's how he drove in traffic. I, I don't think I've ever, to this day, seen another driver that when his car is handling well, 
warp traffic or got through traffic better than Gordon John Cock. I think Gordon John Cock was the best that I've ever seen at getting through traffic. Starting sixth, John Cock ran a strong race. Taking a one-lap penalty for a pit violation, Gordy finished third, one lap behind winner Al Unser. Gordy, you just have to close your eyes and hope that, that he's pointed the right direction. <laughs> he's a talented race car driver, but we always said, you know, that, that if it comes down to the last lap, you better hold on because Gordy's going to go through you or around you some way to win that race. He just, he's, a, he's one that, that we never did say he feathered or throttle. He always held her wide open and pushed on the brake and very little on the brake. <laughs> but he's good. <laughs> Lost in the controversy surrounding Bobby Unser's 1981 win over Mario Andretti was the fact that Gordon Johncock looked like a sure bet for second place. Bobby had the fastest car that day, but Mario and I were uh, fairly close to him. The race itself was marred by accidents and subsequent caution periods. While entering the track under a yellow flag, Bobby Unser passed several cars before merging with traffic, causing a controversy that was not settled until October of that year. John Cox, who had led six times for a total of 52 laps, was running second to Unser on the 194th lap when his engine blew. There was a lot of things uh, happened at Indianapolis that shouldn't happen. You know, a rule should be a rule. Uh, you know, he was the fastest car all day. Uh, you know, he was really quite a lot faster than we were. And was the fastest car, and things like that weren't necessary. You know, I don't know why really you want to take a chance like that when you do have the fastest car and know you can get by your competitors. Why you want to take a chance like that in past cars when you know that it's illegal. Starting from the middle of the second row, Gordon Johncock just missed disaster at the beginning of the 1982 race. Coming down to the start, Kevin Cogan swerved from the middle of the front row, spun across in front of Johncock, and T-boned Gordy's teammate, Mario Andretti. Johncock moved into third. Though he stayed close to the front, he was struggling. Uh, Rick almost lapped me. If it hadn't have been for a yellow, the first part of the race, Rick would have lapped me. Uh, my car was handling terrible. But as, as the race went on and we made adjustments, George Huning made some adjustments on the car, and we talked over the radio about what the car was doing, you know, and he would make the adjustments on the car when he come in, and about the 155th lap, I was the fastest car on the racetrack. You know, with about four laps to go, I knew I had it. You know, I mean, I knew I could catch him. I didn't know I had it. I knew I could catch him. I knew, you know, that I was close enough to him. I would catch him before we got to start finish line, you know, for the checkered flag. When rookie Danny Sullivan crashed on lap 154, John Cock was running second to Mir. On lap 159, the green flag came out, and John Cock outraced Mears into turn one for the lead. John Cock held on to the lead, and on lap 183, stretched his advantage when Mears and Herm Johnson came together in the pits. Taking a full load of fuel, Mears was back out in 19 seconds. Three laps later, John Cock made his final stop, taking only enough fuel to finish the race. His stop was 13 seconds, and by lap 188, he held an 11-second lead over Mears. But John Cock had handling problems. Mears was gaining quickly. Each lap, it kept getting worse and worse and worse. I just kept pushing more and more and more to where I had to get out of it more and more on each corner. That's why that Rick was able to catch me uh, a second to a lap. He was getting the worse each lap, and, uh, you know, the tires, he had run the tires off of it. It was pushing real bad, he was having to run it down on the apron, and it was getting worse every corner. I could see it, and that's why I was able, another reason I was able to, to reel in toward the end as, as quick as we did. By lap 198, Gordy's lead was less than a second. He could stay on it and get a run at me coming through turn three in the short shoot and maybe get underneath me coming off in four. And as the white flag came out, Mears pulled to the inside. He was even with John Cock going into turn one, but had to back off. He didn't cut me off. He had the corner. He had a nose ahead. He had the line. And uh, I just didn't get far enough to side. 
Mears dropped back, but was able to make a final charge at Johncock, coming down for the checker. He dove underneath Gordy at the flag and fell short as Johncock won the race by 16 thousandths of a second. It was the closest margin of victory ever at Indianapolis. The celebration was cut short. After it got quieted down a little bit, uh, I got in Patrick's airplane and uh, flew up here to Michigan to see my mother because she was in very bad shape and it was foggy that night and we couldn't land here in Hastings and we had to land at a city a ways away and my sister came and picked me up and and I came to the hospital to see my mother and she really didn't know at that time who I was or really what had happened and um, we flew back to Indianapolis because I had to be back uh, the next morning I think at six o'clock to, to be on TV uh, at the racetrack and then uh, we had uh, I remember going that day and getting some new clothes and everything for the victory banquet, and uh, we had the victory banquet that night, and uh, I think it was at 10:22 uh, that night when I was on the stage at the victory banquet that my mother died, and so really um, <clears throat> it wasn't too pleasant for me for the next uh, three or four days after I won the race uh, because of that happening. Following two relatively off years for the two-time Indy winner, Gordon Johncock came to practice in 1985 with renewed life. He ran some of the hottest practice laps. But the day before qualifications, Gordon Johncock announced his retirement. I would say that's probably uh, one of the biggest mistakes I made in my life was retiring at that point. But I was just, I guess I was kind of fed up with everything, the way it was happening and taking place. and. Uh, um, we were running fairly well, but we had had problems, and uh, I wasn't happy with the situation, and I guess I thought maybe that was the easiest way out of it, and so I just decided to quit. Not satisfied with his retirement from auto racing, Gordon Johncock was back at the track in 1987 in search of victory number three. I've always often said that I'm going to be the oldest race car driver to ever run at Indianapolis. I still might be. <laughs> Indianapolis, Gordon Johncock was known as a hard charger, but his quiet, business-like manner was often misinterpreted. Gordy is definitely misunderstood. There's no doubt about that. He is, uh, people over the years, many, many people have told me that they don't like Gordon Johncock because he's so arrogant and uh, he's stuck up and... Uh, and he's uh, this and he's that and that there's nothing farther from the truth he's the the typical guy that's quiet if you don't know him he doesn't say much he uh many times won't sign autographs and you can believe me or you you won't believe me but i know this for the for the fact he is embarrassed to do that sort of thing at a race where few have won and fewer still have become legends gordon johncock twice rolled into victory lane and into history at the Indy 500. A race for heroes.